Hello everyone, welcome to the lecture for English Units 1 and 2. My name is Sunny. I'm really excited to be delivering this presentation today and I hope that you find it gives you a really good head start for the subject. Let's jump right into it. So we'll begin with a little bit of information about myself. As I mentioned, my name is Sunny. I completed BC in 2021 and was college ducks of my school with an ATAR of 96.70. I did all three English subjects, so English literature and English language, receiving study scores of 40 plus, and I'm currently in the last year of completing my degree at Monash University, uh, and I'm doing a Bachelor of Paramedicine. So you can follow along um, on the bottom bar where we're up to, but we're essentially covering all the year 12 exam sections that you're also doing this year as part of your school-based assessments in year 11, text response, crafting text, and analyzing argument. Um, we also have a section on basic English skills that you need for this year, um, as well as breaking down some criteria. Don't worry too much about scrambling to take notes. You will be able to view the lecture recording from the same page that you're on. If I'm not wrong, for about a week, I think it's available for a week. Um, and you can use the live chat Q&A to ask me questions live while the session is running. Um, I will be present on the live chat and answering you guys' questions as you go through the broadcast. Um, <clears throat> And you can also download the slides from the same page that you are on. Um, and let's get started. Okay, so these are the three sections of the exam. Really useful to keep in mind um, during year 11. So your section A of the exam is reading and responding, which is your text response essay, or also known as your analytical essay. Essentially, you will be studying one text and you will have the choice from two different prompts. You will have to choose one of the prompts and construct a contention or interpretation in response to that prompt, along with a relevant essay. Um, everything you write, every single argument has to be about the prompt. And you need a counter argument. So you will be choosing whether you agree with the prompt more or disagree with the prompt more and accordingly have one additional body paragraph argument that uh, acts as a counter argument to your own opinion. Um, there's no comparison, no exter external sources, and there's minimal background information with the exception that you need to know about the context of your text, not only detailing it in your introduction, in your context sentence, but you will also have to, uh, for a very strong essay, some of your analysis should be tying back to the context of the text. Section B is your crafting texts task. Um, until very recently, um, the study design was changed a year ago. This used to be a comparative essay, and now it is an essay with sort of creative writing components. I'll get into more detail about it, but it's not the same as a creative response. Um, I'll get into more detail about it when we're talking uh, about that section. Keep an eye out on the VCAR English page um, because probably or sometime this year a sample exam will be produced in preparation for the year 12 English students examination and you will be able to have a look at what this task is going to be like on the exam. <clears throat> now, section C we cover very briefly today because you'll be doing it as uh, in the beginning of unit uh, two, I believe. So uh, we'll still have a little look at it, but this is your analysis of persuasive language techniques. You'll be reading texts like opinion pieces and articles, um, and your job will be to um, analyze the author's argument and how they're trying to persuade their readers. So when you write a contention, that will be based around uh, what the author's key argument is and what they're trying to do for their whole piece. 
breaking your topic sentences for each body paragraph into smaller arguments that are embedded within the piece. Um, beautiful. So first having a look at the criteria for text response. What is being assessed is firstly your knowledge and understanding of the text. So it needs to be, uh, you need to have a vast array of evidence um, and quotes to uh, substantiate your interpretation. And you must ensure that this isn't just um, quotes from characters, etc. You must have structural features, language devices named appropriately using the correct meta language and analyze as well throughout your piece, in particular, paying attention to uh, genre conventions. So for example, if you're studying a film, you must have lots of analysis of film techniques throughout your essay. Um, and you also demonstrate your understanding of a text through, your, through the quality of your analysis and how strong your ideas are, your analytical ideas. Um, you're also marked on your exploration of a text's ideas and issues, making it clear that you understand the author's views, values, and authorial intent in depth. So there should be a lot of authorial intent analysis uh, and the author's views and values, and you need to make sure you have strong interpretations of the author's messages that are embedded within the text in relation to the various themes that are present in your text and uh, concerns and the context. Um, development of coherent analysis in response to the topic. So this is making sure that you have a logical ordering of ideas and arguments. Your arguments uh, <clears throat> directly relate to your contention as does your contention to your arguments um, you've created a strong contention interpretation and sub arguments um, and these are all in relation to the prompt there is a counter argument all of those things um, need to be done and you're also as an english student assessed based on your control and effectiveness of language use uh, how well you structure your essays how good are you at integrating quotes into sentences fluently so that they flow um, within your sentences? How good are you at structuring your sentences, your sentence flow, the clarity and potential flourish uh, within your vocabulary? Okay. Now for argument analysis criteria, you're assessed on your knowledge and understanding of the argument of the offer. So you need to ensure that you understand the contention of the offer and the arguments and the points of view. There should also be analysis of language and visual features. So the majority of your body of these analyzing argument essays um, will be comprised of persuasive language techniques and analysis of these, either in terms of the uh, you'll either be analyzing the intended effect on the audience, so how the author is aiming to position their audience, what do they uh, want to make them think or feel or do, as well as tying persuasive language techniques back to how they enhance the credibility of of that main argument as well as your sub arguments. So that's known as the what, how, why process is how you write your pretty much your entire body and we'll be looking at that as well. <clears throat> Again, you're assessed on the control and effectiveness of your language use. So just as a note for the entirety of this year and something I really want you to not disregard is the importance of planning. You need to be planning for every essay um, and it is not a waste of time. Practice with detailed plans at first and then you will get more efficient and faster at creating plans. Remembering that at the end of year 12 in your exam you only have 60 minutes per essay and you will have free essays to write. Uh, the only way to get high marks is being able to put your best ideas on the paper, come up with the strongest contention, strongest arguments and evidence to use, 
And the way to do that is by practicing planning, getting more efficient at it, creating better plans over time. Um, it ensures that you are not starting with your, you're not putting down your first ideas, but you're putting down your strongest ideas. So when you're planning um, to write in response to a prompt, plan your contention and topic sentences and note down the evidence that you're going to use, as we can see from this example here. So your contention is your interpretation statement that goes into your introduction and it gives your main response to the prompt and it should incorporate both your main position as well as your counter argument. So we see that being done here in this sentence. And then your topic sentences are your sub arguments. They present ideas that you are trying to prove for the rest of the paragraph. So make sure that you are not just writing statements, um, but ideas that you can prove. And having a variety of evidence, we can see some meta language terms and literary devices scattered here like um, imagery being mentioned, for instance, but you should have more evidence than this. I recommend aiming for at least four pieces of evidence per body paragraph, and you can increase that to even more by combining quotes and analyzing them together as one where you find that to be um, suitable. <clears throat> so there's lots of meta language that you can learn and use those big fancy words, elevated language. Um, and that should include your understanding of a vast array of literary devices. As a student in this subject, you should be able to know what they mean, be able to define them, give an example, find it, them in a text and understand the general purpose so you can link it and create a specific analysis in your essays. You should also create text uh, specific uh, meta language lists. So uh, words that are good to use when discussing your particular text, whether they relate to the context, whether they relate to certain concepts that are presented, you can take your book and look for meaningful one word quotes that act as really good descriptors and scatter them in your essays for stylistic effect and create vocab lists with meta language, just focusing on different word classes like verbs, adverbs, adjectives, nouns, to find some words that are highly specific and elevated that you can pretty much use for any essay of any type. Find some strong authorial intent verbs that you can use to describe their views and values messages. You'll always be able to use these. Find some words to describe tone, especially in preparation for analyzing argument where you will have to describe tone and you will have to describe um, tonal shifts. Look for um, impactful adjectives and nouns, especially synonyms that you can replace so you're not repeating the same words again and again in your essays. Your evidence and analysis have to be intertwined. Um, if you want to be a, a student that does well in English, you should never quote something or have evidence and move on without analyzing it. Um, that will always stick out to your assessors. That being said, if you have a quote and it's not very meaningful, you don't have much to say about it, disregard it. Don't put it in your essay, use a different quote. Um, the only exception to that is, um, uh, I guess if you're saying that um, if you present evidence, you analyze it and you want to present another piece of evidence saying uh, this idea that I've just analyzed is further supported by this other quote. So you can do that every once in a while um, as well. That's the only exception. You can avoid summary and retelling of the story uh, through various methods. One that I'll show you is nominalization. This is where you convert other word classes, usually verbs, into noun form and place them at the head of the sentence, changing the sentence's grammatical structure to essentially force you 
to have to analyze um have to analyze in that sentence rather than just you know closing the sentence so if we have a look at an example the playwright depicts bob walking down the street through the movement of his feet one in front of the other this is only evidence this is only retelling but if we take this verb depicts and nominalize it turning it into the noun depiction placing it at the head of the sentence we can see how this has changed the sentence's structure the playwright's depiction of bob walking down the street through the movement of his feet one in front of the other implies that because we can't end the sentence after the quote anymore due to having nominalized this verb um, it forces us to then go and analyze and as long as you put in a, a, a significant um, you can do this if, if you're one of the students that struggles with that pretty much works with every single word you can see all of these intent verbs converted so it would work with any of them so as i said normal nominalization forces you to analyze but at the same time it's also going to prevent you from just retelling plot elements which we know in english over contextualization if you start describing where you took evidence from and what was happening surrounding this quote that you're using english will penalize you um your essay will not be succinct and it will have a lot of rambling um and we need to avoid any summary uh, and only have minimal minimal background information attached to our quotes so looking at another example the character experiences a plethora of emotions as she walks down the neighborhood she grew up in that's an example of retelling the story um and after altering it the character's experience of a plethora of emotions as she walks down the neighborhood reflects the conflicting events of her childhood and there is an analytical idea there to elaborate upon this is a vocab list that every student should have create a list of intent verbs this is not an exhaustive list whatsoever so fill it in with keeps more um, and ensure that you avoid um, the, the very simple and repetitive terms that uh, English uh, teachers and assessors do not like to see. So need to remove show completely from your vocabulary. It should never be used. And the same with the words make and says. Okay, so find replacements for those words and other ways that you can um, you can express it. Be more specific. So for show, for instance, implies, underscores, indicates, they all have different meanings and are specific in their connotations, whereas show is a vague and very simple word to use, and that's, that's why it's frowned upon in this subject. Um, it will simplify your writing. And um, you need to pay attention to modality of the language that you use. Um, modal verbs are types of verbs that express uh, a degree or level of certainty. So high modality means being really certain and really confident in something. This is exactly what this means. This is exactly what happened. Low modality, on the other hand, means being really uncertain about something. So your job as an English student to write you is to write using only low modality language to ensure that you are not judging the merits of text or saying that your interpretation of a text is the only correct interpretation. So we see an example here, high modality terms like must, shall. So imagine you're writing, oh, this must mean that uh, this, this has to indicate that the author meant this. Um, well, that's completely um, fence-sitting um, and is not how um, you can write in the subject. But you can use terms like may, could, uh, you know, this may indicate that the author meant this, which aren't definitive because obviously we can't read the author's mind. So now we'll look at some of the basic skills that you need in the subject. We're first having a look at 
um, the process of analysis for language analysis, analyzing argument. We'll come back to this later in the lesson towards the end and look at an example but i would like you to understand it and remember it for now because we won't come back to the step by step of it um but you should be analyzing persuasive language techniques that the author has used like statistical evidence rhetorical questions using this what how why process because this ensures that you are doing everything that you're being assessed on and you can get those marks so for every persuasive language technique you want to put in in the body of your essay as evidence first you need to um write about what language the author is using this means attaching a quote and actually naming the persuasive language technique and just explaining if needed what that uh persuasive language technique means then you have the option of either analyzing the how or the why or both. And this will depend on how relevant that PLT is, which is what I'll call them from, from now on. How relevant you think the PLT is, do you want to analyze it in depth, then you may complete both the how and the why analysis, or do you think intended effect is relevant? Or do you think the contribution to the author's argument is relevant to analyze? So we'll look at it in more detail. Um, starting with the what, okay? So this is your persuasive language technique. What you're trying to answer is what is the author doing? You quote and you name the persuasive language technique. Looking at an example, the author makes use of overtly negative language, such as terrible human being, to establish Chris Brown in an unfavorable light. So overtly negative language, that's the name of our PLT, negative language. This is the quote that's been embedded. And this is the explanation of this evidence. It's used to establish Chris Brown in an unfavorable light. Um, and this one uses, this, this example uh, is it all about connotations, negative connotations, reminiscent of gang violence and brutal street fights. Again, has to be quoted. And there was another example there. Now, again, we said you can analyze the how or the why of your selected PLT or both in the body of your essay. So the how is the... Um, answering the question how is the audience being positioned by the author remember that it's not the actual effect so you need to use that low modality language it is the intended effect it's what the author is aiming for so use appropriate language i've highlighted some of the ones the offer is inviting readers to do something is engendering a certain emotion, a sense of fear in this case, seeking to marginalize. So seeks, aims, incites, feelings of, invites, encourages. That's the kind of vocabulary uh, you may use. Um, and add more to the list because uh, you don't want to be repeating yourself in your essay when you write about intended effect. So as an example, thus the author invites readers to consider how their support of Brown might endorse his harmful behavior. Um, so we can see based on what wording has been used that it's talking about intended effect. Um, notice that it says thus, so you must have an explanation of your PLT preceding this in order for this to make sense because it needs to be clear how the intended effect is created through the language. Um, and we've got a few more examples there. So this is another example with high and low modality language to avoid fence sitting. So make sure you don't sound so definitive. Um, and these are a kind of kinds of phrases you could be using for your how analysis. Now the why is the most complex and um, one that you need to make sure you've scattered throughout your essay because it can fetch you a lot of marks for that reason. Um, but the why is answering the question, why does this support the author's argument? Essentially, you link in 
how the persuasive language technique either supports and enhances your topic sentence, your sub argument to make it more convincing, or how does it link into the contention, the author's big argument, the main argument of the piece to enhance that con contention and make it more convincing. So this is, it, it, that's exactly what it is. Um, so as an example, as such, the author creates a comprehensively negative image of Brown. So by creating a comprehensively negative image of the celebrity based on all the language with negative connotations that was used to describe him, that furthers the idea that he should not be allowed into Australia. And that second half of this sentence is the why, okay, and how it furthers the argument. Another example. Does the author seek to inspire a unity amongst her readers to ensure they all criticize how celebrities get a free pass when it comes to misdemeanors? As you can see, this is the bit where you need to get creative. Don't forget that you need to make it clear how this occurs. How is that argument more convincing? So notice here it says by inspiring a unity amongst her readers to make them feel like they're part of one group. Okay, this, this, this effect is created. All right, so that's all on that language analysis little introduction. Now looking at the elements of text response and elements of text in general. This is a skill that you will need um, for the rest of your VC English and you will need it in crafting text as well. So you need to make sure you're all across this. Um, basically, your texts are mostly comprised of, and your essays as well, of evidence. Your structural features, language devices, your quotes, um, these are very necessary and you need, like I said, to have a vast range of different evidence. This is what will get you the higher marks in this subject in English. Characters are also important. They are your evidence. They are the constructs of the author that they have created and depicted in a certain way in order to comment something through them, okay? So you need to discuss them as a technique as well. Not Romeo represents something, something, but the author depicts or portrays uh, Romeo in a certain way in order to do what? That's the way you need to be writing, making it clear that the character isn't an actual alive being and that it is a construct of the author. Make sure you are correctly structuring these sentences. Um, <clears throat> and themes are self-explanatory. You know, find the top five to 10 themes in your text that prompts can be based around. Uh, make sure you have arguments and interpretations and quotes and analytical ideas for all of these. Um, views and values will fetch you the high marks though. These are your interpretations of the author's messages and opinions that you will need to write about. It shouldn't be just included in the concluding sentence of each paragraph of a text response essay, but it should be somewhere within the body paragraph as well, where you have extended your analysis of evidence even further to link into a views and values message. So aim for body paragraphs to have at least two authorial intent messages in each body paragraph to get good marks in English. So I recommend that you make notes on all of this for all of your texts, find structural features, language devices, note down quotes for them, analyze them, find quotes of characters, analyze them, note them down, have a themes based quote bank <clears throat> and have views and values ideas and interpreta interpretations written down for your text. Now, I mentioned the importance of this before, but you need to look for text-specific structural features. So when you're working with a text of a certain genre, it will have its own genre-specific um, uh, language devices. You need to be aware of these, be able to find them and analyze them, scatter them, um, scatter not just normal quotes in your essays, you know, like dialogue and stuff, but scatter lots and lots of um, actual language devices, 
and uh, features of a text construction and analyze those as well. So we've got an example there as well that aims to use a lot of meta language. Having a look here, animal imagery is also employed when the nurse sees Medea glaring at them like a bull. So animal imagery is when a human is being assigned animal-like qualities. This is this could also be called a simile because it employs the word like. So she's being compared to a bull. Um, and we see that successfully incorporates a language device because it's imagery um, and uses the meta language to make that clear. There's another one. All the animals used to describe her are unpredictably dangerous and aggressive, paralleling Medea's own savage temperament. So parallels, when we draw parallels between two things, we're saying that those two things are very similar. So that in itself is a language device and the appropriate vocabulary has been used. Now, authorial intent slash views and values, it's the same thing really, it gets the A's. So I've already explained that this is every time you write about the author's message, opinion, what me all the messages that they're trying to convey. So basically you're looking for things that they agree with and that they disagree with disagree with what things do they endorse and celebrate and basically say that they're good things and what things do they um critique and say are wrong or what things are they conflicted about and that can be anything that can be in terms of certain values in terms of the prevailing mood in that society what the context was when they published the text um, in terms of certain personal attributes they examine within their characters and all of those things are authorial intent so at least two times per body paragraph and it should be in the concluding sentence of your introduction your body paragraphs your conclusion each each concluding sentence should be um, an authorial intent message have and the only way to have these is to have heaps of opinions about your set text. Um, make sure you're also writing about this by using the author's last name paired with um, an, an intent verb, what we just looked at, all those verbs that discuss what the author is trying to do, um, to indicate to your assessor that it is in fact not analysis, simple analysis, but it is authorial intent that you are talking about. So in general, as an example of how you can do this, for instance, let's, let's imagine you took a structural feature such as a metaphor. Um, your analysis of the metaphor is a discussion of what the metaphor represents, zooming into the language and examining the effect of the language itself and the language device. You choose to discuss this further. You could end it here at analysis, but you've decided that you can relay an authorial intent message by analyzing this metaphor in more detail. So then your authorial intent basically answers the question, what is the author's message in utilizing that metaphor to represent the idea you've just analyzed and presented? Looking at an example, the quote could be a description of the reflections of the palace, the Republic as bent and brown. Your analysis of the actual evidence is the intriguing nature of the description and to you're linking it back to the socio-cultural context in your analysis so the palace history in east germany directly from that you want to uh, write an authorial intent message of what the author is trying to comment about this socio-cultural context um, okay so through this the author is suggesting that even after their demise the Stasi are still bending facts and fabricating fictions in order to seek control over East Germans. And there we go. That's a authorial intent commentary about the context of this text. So it's just a simple three-step process, really. Now, if you're looking to score highly in this subject as a little summary, you must be making sure you're addressing all of those four elements and you're confident using all those four elements from the pyramid we looked at. So your views and values, themes, characters and structural features, you must be making sure you're using 
lots of quotes. I recommended at least four per body paragraph. You need to become skilled at integrating and blending quotes into your sentences. We don't want to see sent uh, quotes that don't wrap into sentences smoothly and don't fit the sentence. Be using um, you must be using ellipses, square brackets to cut down your quotes and make them fit into sentences. Be able to combine quotes, cut down your quotes into three to five words um, that are most relevant, um, et cetera, et cetera. So practice this skill throughout the year. Um, focus on uh, structural features and language devices rather than always using quotes about characters and plot of the text and analyzing these because these are simple. So this is how you can differentiate yourself from the rest of the cohort. Have a foreal intent analysis. Don't memorize your essays because they will not respond to the prompt and therefore they will not qualify for a lot of the marks. Um, explore the complexity by having a counter argument for your prompts um, and center arguments on ideas rather than characters or examples. So this is just more about characters as constructs and using the appropriate language. As another example, the author portrays a character as something in order to not analyzing the character on its own. So making sure um, that we're using the correct language. That being said, characters are important characters are relevant look for important description if we know that characters are constructs obviously that means they relay messages and ideas that our author um, has by presenting for instance a character as good making us as readers endorse them the characters uh, the author is likely celebrating or uh, certain qualities that that uh, character has and by condemning them making making the reader view them in an unfavorable light they're probably um, presenting certain qualities as negative okay um, just something to pay attention to more on the correct language but character prompts are a type of prompt in English and this is one that students often write on inappropriately. Um, so just want to remind that character, when you get a character prompt that mentions characters, you still need to focus your arguments on ideas, arguments, and not characters. So uh, you'll be linking characters to a certain theme or view and value that uh, the prompt mentions, okay? Um, but your arguments still present ideas rather than mentioning a specific character. In general, it shouldn't be one character per paragraph ever. Um, in each body paragraph, more than one character uh, should be, you know, you should be writing quotes for them and analyzing them more than one character in each body paragraph always. Looking at an example, the characters in I for Isabel have suppressed their emotions. Do you agree? So what we would not want to see in your writing is having a character per paragraph, like character one suppresses their emotions, character two also suppresses their emotions. However, character three has not suppressed their emotions. So there is no argument there or idea. Um, it's just retelling about characters without linking to anything significant. So you still need to focus on the broader ideas and pay attention to the keywords in the prompt. It's all about emotions and whether they've been suppressed. Okay. So one argument may be is that the characters find it difficult to suppress their emotions. Note how any names have been taken out. The characters find it difficult to suppress their emotions because their past experiences have wounded them beyond repair. Body paragraph two is different approaches characters take to triumph over their emotions. And body paragraph three is many characters are able to suppress their emotions to different extents, though none actually 100% succeed. So note how there's a different idea in each of these arguments 
and the topic sentence suggests that different characters will be used to examine each argument. Let's jump into text response. So reminding that the task is essentially an analytical essay on one text and you have those two prompts in year 12 on the exam that will be just one of your unit free texts at the moment in year, in year 11 it's what your teachers assign you all sections of the exam are equally weighted at a third of exam marks uh, with two assessors marking um, your essay and giving it a mark out of 10 which are supposed to match they use the same exact um, rubric and criteria that's made available to you as students from the VCA English page so you can actually see how you're assessed. I recommend in year 11 preparing for SACs using exam criteria rather than just the school SAC criteria that can give you a really good basis going into year 12 for the exam. So when you get a prompt, your whole essay has to be on that prompt, um, as we mentioned. So the first thing you need to do is determine the category of the prompt um, that you've been given or that you've chosen. We've just discussed character based prompts. There will also be thematic prompts that are based around how a certain theme is represented in the text. There will be views and values prompts that state or speculate a message that the author is trying to relate and you need to agree or disagree that that is the message. Um, and there will be structural prompts that are all about examining how a text has been constructed um, through the examining of all the small elements that go into its construction, known as structural features. These begin with how, usually. Um, you may not be doing much of them this year, so uh, don't stress too much about it, but try to learn about it in preparation for next year. Um, next, it would be beneficial to annotate your prompts. Um, highlight all the keywords, because if you miss a keyword in your prompt and you don't write about it, you don't create an argument about it, that means your essay will not be answering the prompt sufficiently. Also, if two terms are put side by side, they cannot be treated as the same term, even though they may appear synonymous. So you may benefit from having a dictionary to understand how, say, two adjectives that have been put side by side are slightly different in meaning. So you can treat them and analyze them both as separate. You may then rephrase the prompt if it's difficult to answer. You may phrase it into a question or you may move certain words around. Um, <clears throat> look for the core and implications. Look for, you know, if this is the case, then what's the consequence? What is the author trying to say if I assume that this is correct? Uh, and other questions you can come up with to form your topic sentences. So we'll look at that in a bit more detail, okay? So there are some ways in which you could write. I like to have um, just the understanding that topic sentences have to build on each other with your first body paragraph argument being the most simple, your second being more complex and something you are only able, an argument you're only able to make because of your first argument and your third one being the most complex which is likely simply going to mean that your third argument is going to be your counter argument, okay? And that's just how I always used to view it. If it makes it easier to have a specific idea for a prompt, you can use you can use this little um, template. So in paragraph one, you could be defining the keywords in the prompt and providing examples for them. So whatever the keyword of the prompt is, you're giving examples of it in the text. So let's say it's a certain theme you're writing about in what ways that theme is presented in the text. In your second body paragraph, you might be exploring the causes for the prompt statement, so the core and how these are seen in the text. What causes 
whatever the prompt mentions to occur what causes those feelings that the prompt mentions to occur in the characters why do they feel them and your third body paragraph might be then looking at the consequences and the significance of these I've got an alternative method down below we'll look at an example with this method though um let's say our prompt is friendship is more important than magic in harry potter to what extent do you agree now in the first body par body paragraph you would be i know this is a very simplistic example but you would be defining friendship and magic and where you see those in the text how are they represented in different ways through the different characters etc if we're looking at causes then we would write about what causes friendship and what causes magic what are the factors that work together to cause them to occur and then you'd be looking at the consequences of friendship consequences of magic are there positive or negative implications um, are these significant is the author trying to comment something through them okay so remembering back to this uh pyramid very very important um and you need to remember that all of these elements need to form part of your essay and you need to have knowledge of all of these elements for your text <clears throat> your recommended body paragraph structure is teal um, i recommend not being a student that frowns upon teal um, and thinks how am i going to stand out if everyone writes using the same structure english will reward you for having a solid structure okay your job as the student is to flourish by making the content of that essay very very strong and very very engaging deep analytical while maintaining a solid structure so it's about the content it's not about the structure so everyone should at this stage loosely be sticking to teal every body paragraph should be starting with a topic sentence that presents your argument idea that is in response to the prompt then the majority of your body paragraph will be comprised of evidence and explanation evidence and explanation which are your quotes explained and analyzed and potentially you know if you go that one step further views and values analysis every once in a while and you'd close with your concluding sentence that must be about all for ill intent and it must <clears throat> link back to your topic sentence so when you write a concluding sentence about the author's views and values it's essentially you're writing what the author has to say about this argument that you've identified these two must be related your opening and your closing okay um <clears throat> Please note where it says evidence with explanation. Um, your evidence, you can't just analyze evidence straight away. You need to explain. If you're saying the evidence has a certain effect, you need to explain how that's created. So you need to zoom in before you zoom out. How does this language create this effect? How does this technique create this effect that you're trying to uh, present in your analysis. It needs to be made clear to your assessor. So, detailed structure for your introductions. Begin with a context sentence that introduces your text. These are important. They stop you from getting stuck in starting your essays. And you can still be creative with them. And you don't have to start them in a conventional way. Your context sentence introduces the context of your text. Um, so looking at an example here set against the backdrop of rampant industrialism that's our socio-cultural context then you have the name of the author uh text type and genre and title charles dickens classic novella a christmas carol endorses the notion of the value of life and that last ending bit would be broadly linking to the prompt um, and the unconventional one um, 
is essentially only going to int introduce um, the title of the text, text type genre, all of that in the contention. And it's starting with immediate engagement. Emily Bronte casts her characters into a claustrophobic and isolated expanse where they are left to express their true nature and act out their innermost desire. So it starts in an engaging way, talking about the world of the text, uh, the general world of the uh, the world of the text as a whole. Then you should have your contention statement, which presents your, um, you know, your whole, um, that main response you have in relation to the prompt, expressing your main position and point of view, and your counter argument. And then you should follow that with an outline of your topic sentences, your sub arguments, in one or two sentences and close with a simple views and values message. You can close with something more simple for your intro because you haven't analyzed anything yet. So that views and values message can be something quite straightforward just to close the paragraph nicely. Don't mention genre of the text unless you will be discussing it. But what I say is that you always should remember back to the, that if you want high marks, you need to be using some genre specific techniques and language devices. So I do recommend to mention it and analyze it. Um, don't talk about the offer at all. The only thing you mention that's sort of outside information is the context of the text. Um, we see an example of, of context being um, context and the world of the text being examined then that signpost of your topic sentences with a views and values uh, sentence to close your intro so back to topic sentences as we said they're your sub arguments they stem from your contention from your overall interpretation um, they must be rewarded from how you worded them in the introduction in your arguments outline so make sure that you don't leave them as the same. It really stands out and looks poorly done. And they must be relevant to your prompt and making sure that a counter argument is there. There are some general rules. Firstly, understanding that you're presenting an idea, not a statement. It shouldn't have quotes. It shouldn't have any evidence being mentioned, um, any character names being mentioned either. All of that should be avoided. It's just an idea that you are proving for the rest of the paragraph. Oh, you're basically saying this is something that is present in the text and this is significant. This is how. And then you're trying to prove that for the rest of your body paragraph. So it, this is a good way to test yourself as well. But when you read your topic sentence, <clears throat> your assessor should be thinking, OK, tell me how this happens, how this is seen that would indicate that you are on the right track. So Vika and your assessors, as you can see in this image, they look quite closely at your topic sentences and how good they are. And as I mentioned, topic sentences and concluding sentences are related. So a topic sentence essentially says something is a key idea and your concluding sentence is saying, this is what the author says about this idea. I presented in my topic sentence. Having um, a look at this example, although some characters seek to overcome their social disadvantages, many of them struggle to improve their lives in the face of prejudice. And that's the idea we're trying to prove for the rest of their of our body paragraph. Uh, with two sub arguments in there, we'll need to show that characters try to overcome social disadvantages and we'll need to show that uh, they're struggling to face off against prejudice. The concluding sentence and the author's message in relation to this argument is, thus the text reveals the perilous and often emotionally taxing journey the characters must undertake before being able to triumph over society's expectations. Basically to show that this is a really difficult feat. Um, and essentially make your concluding sentences as strong and as interesting as possible 
they do need to be something you've clearly justified through your body paragraph. It can't be something far-fetched, but the assessors pay the most attention to uh, your topic sentences and your concluding sentences when it comes to body paragraphs. So you need to um, try to make these ideas as, as strong as possible. <clears throat> so body paragraphs uh, must start with an argument and then it's basically teal, evidence analysis, evidence analysis. If it makes it easier, I never used to think of it in this way, but you can split uh, your body paragraph almost into two halves to ensure that you cover at least a couple of ideas, a couple of sub ideas. So you can view the first half as your body of your body paragraph trying to discuss and justify one sub argument and the second half would be trying to justify through evidence and analysis another sub argument. Now you finish with your views and values linking back to the topic sentence, but as I said, it should be done at least in one other place in your body paragraph where you extend an analysis of evidence and you go into views and values. Um, <clears throat> avoid mentioning characters in the last half of your views and value statements, otherwise it won't be smooth. Um, and we see some great strong examples of um, those closing sentences. So when writing conclusions, your first sentence should essentially be something along the lines of overall, here is the summary of my idea for my essay, right? So as an example, Shelley explores the complexity of human morality in Frankenstein, and it is through the creature that Shelley considers they may possess both good and evil. Now, you can spend more time, one to two sentences, summarizing your idea for the essay, and then you should close with your most mic drop, impactful views and values message for if it's a theme, basically, what do you think is the key idea of the author for that theme? Put that most impressive idea there at the bottom. Um, so might look something like, therefore, Shelley ultimately suggests that, um, therefore, both authors present the rigid ideology as being insular, yielding the potential to diminish communities. I've put some questions down um, on this slide here that can help you come up with views and values statements by answering them for your text. Um, but uh, essentially, this idea of going into more detail to summarize the key idea of your essay, it's quite optional. My conclusions used to be around probably around the 60 words mark, maybe 50 words. Um, so this is needs to be very short. It's what's in your body that's important. Short and impactful is what you want to aim for. Okay, Rem reminder of the importance of structural features being analyzed and being really familiar with structural features for your set text. And uh, I want to stress that you must avoid summary. A lot of students seem to kind of get it, but still summarize when they write most of the time. So it's really important to understand the difference between summarizing and analyzing. So summarizing is essentially rephrasing evidence from the text in our own words and giving it a lot of background information that is unnecessary. Um, and analyzing is the actual significance of the evidence being interpreted. Um, you need to treat your, when you write essays, you need to treat it like you know that your assessor is, and your teacher is an expert with your particular text, and that there is no need to go into detail about the plot and what's happening surrounding a quote. It needs to be succinct uh, if the contextualization is necessary. So we have an example of a summary and analysis, though Juliet beseeches Romeo to be some other name, he is reluctant to abandon the reputable name of Montague. That's just retell, okay? Because now we're just detailing what his actual name is, but that doesn't hold any significance to us. 
In this example, on the other hand, Juliet reveals she is willing to no longer be a Capulet if Romeo will not deny his father and refuse his name, thus demonstrating that her strength and boldness surpasses his. So note that this sentence, by incorporating more quotes, a second quote, was able to make it more clear what the quotes were about and in that way not have to explain anything and went straight into analysis in the second half of the sentence rather than just ending the sentence there. So that's a great strategy. You can avoid retelling the story by having evidence and analysis placed in the same sentence, okay? Looking at this example, Thunder meets Miriam, and when she does, she calls her cartoon boy. It's not only bad because of how it's been phrased, <coughs> but a sign of a low scoring student in English is when students write uh, sentences that are just the quote pretty much like this one moreover Miriam is holding a single rose in front of her body there's no skill when it comes to integrating quotes there are short sentences that just give us a quote um, everything should flow so looking at the other example when first meeting Miriam Thunder likens her to a cartoon boy, highlighting the unrealistic and unbelievable nature of a very human and real character. So vocabulary and those it's kind of like your intent verbs, they can keep you on track as well and force you to analyze. But extending your sentence past just having evidence will also help. We see it's been done well as well with the other one. And note that the quote has been modified this time to change the grammar of this quote to um, integrate it nicely. Miriam holding a single rose in front of her body symbolizes the foreign nature of her traumatic past as well as her tragic love for her late husband, then closes with a views and values message from the author. So it flows really nicely. So what do those mid-range essays generally do that we should try to avoid? Starting sentences with quotes instead of integrating them and blending them nicely, including long quotes without breaking them up, and especially if they're not being analysed, maybe the student just explains it and leaves it without analysing it. Um, ending sentences with a quote and then moving on to a different example or idea, again, rather than analysing not modifying quotes, starting with quotes that proves a point without explaining how it does. So I said the how is very important, only including maybe free quotes for a paragraph. All of these should be avoided. And our high range essays instead will aim to keep short quotes as short as possible, break them up, cut them down, use those square brackets, use those ellipses, uh, paraphrasing parts of the text and only quoting the most relevant language and throwing away the rest of the quote that's not as relevant. Integrating quotes and analysis in the same sentence, just like the example we looked at now. Never leaving a crucial quote unanalyzed. Never moving on until it's been analyzed. Having blended and analyzed quotes. Using square brackets and ellipses. Let's have a look at an example. I want to leave and go home. Sally describes how she wanted to go home. <clears throat> so we use square brackets to modify um, a quote grammatically without changing its meaning. We're not allowed to change its meaning, change the word. We only change the grammar to make it fit into the sentence the way that we want to. And we use the triple dot, right? to uh, signify that we don't care about this word, leave, okay? We're omitting it. You should pull from a variety of different evidence as we chatted about and incorporate structural features. Hopefully that helps to make it clear and give you uh, an idea of how to study and prepare. Um, but I want to bring up the idea as well that essays have to answer prompts directly, not just bring on key terms. Your whole essay is trying to answer the prompt the whole time. Um, so 
That being said, prompts are quite specific in what they want, especially uh, exam prompts uh, from Vika. So don't memorize essays. You will get very low marks for memorized essays and they're very easy to spot. Now, when we break down a prompt, I said the contention and the argument have to be directly related. So looking at a prompt, in After Darkness, friendship is the primary powerful force for good. Do you agree? So your contention, your interpretation that goes in your intro, is your main answer to the prompt that encompasses your main argument and your counter argument. For instance, whilst friendship promotes good throughout the text, one must also consider broader determining factors that create good in this microcosm of World War II. So it says, I do agree that friendship is a primary force for good. However, I believe there are other factors that create good even more in this setting. So we can see it does exactly what I said. And then your arguments are like your why. Why do you believe what you do in your contention? Prove it. Um, and we can see here, there's an argument about friendship acting as a primary force for good. Another one that also agrees with the prompt explains how it's a primary powerful force for good. And there's the third one that's the counter argument that says there is something else other than friendship that is even more important in this setting. And that's been identified as exposure. So approach your prompts, highlight the key terms so you understand what needs to be discussed. None of them can be disregarded. Every key term must be addressed in your essay for your arguments and sub arguments. Um, you can turn the prompt into a question or even move words around as long as it doesn't change the meaning of it um, to make it easier to, to answer for your essay. Come up with questions to write your topic sentences as well. So we'll look at an example and try to find the strongest ideas. Don't go with your first ideas. Looking at this prompt, despite Atwood's portrayal of Gilead as soulless and destructive, she has nevertheless succeeded in giving the reader a sense of optimism to what extent do you agree? I would actually highlight succeeded as well. Did she succeed or not? Um, so we've highlighted the key words. Remember that soulless and destructive is not the same. So you need to both examine somewhere. Um, it shouldn't mention Gilead in any of your arguments, okay? That should be within your body paragraph because we said character names cannot be in topic sentences okay so present an idea and gilead will be examined within the body of that body within that body paragraph somewhere through evidence and analysis now soulless means he doesn't care about anything destructive means he destroys things so you need to analyze these terms separately in your essay you need to at some that's to some level examine whether she succeeded did she even set out to cr create a sense of optimism or did she set out to create a different sense for readers completely? So we see it's been rephrased as a question. If that helps you, go for it. If it's easier to phrase as a question, if you like to leave it as a statement, that's also fine. That's an optional step. And then you ask questions to come up with your arguments. For example, is Gilead completely solid? Does he have different qualities? Does Atwood succeed in giving the reader optimism? Is this what she was even trying to do? Is there a different thing that she was trying to achieve? Why is there optimism? What's what's causing it? Nothing's mentioned by the prompt, just why is there optimism? Is it due to Atwood's portrayal of Gilead or is it despite her portrayal? Is there a different reason um, there's a sense of optimism in the text? What kind of optimism is afforded? You could come up with a hundred different questions for a prompt, um, and that's just a few. And then we have an overall contention, topic sentences. We just complete that plan. So our overall contention, Atwood's Handmaid's Tale, is a harsh admonition of a regressive theocracy and patriarchal hegemony, offering a sense of optimism only in its reformation. So we're saying that uh, we disagree with the prompt, there is no optimism, okay? 
in the first half of this contention statement, we're saying it's basically a critique of a, because it's a dystopian text, it's a critique of a awful society with an awful belief system. Um, it's patriarchal, male dominated. And the only sense of optimism we get is from thinking that things could change. That's the counter argument. There is some hope that things may change in the future. And we see each argument relates to that contention idea quite well. Um, so as we said, you cannot completely agree, you cannot completely disagree, and you cannot be neutral. A counter argument is needed whether you um, agree with the prompt more or you disagree with the prompt more, you'll still need a counter argument. So studying for text response. We'll look at the year 12's past exams and examiner's reports, um, read the feedback, get yourself off to a good start this year by reading feedback for the whole cohort to think about what you need to change in your writing and what things um, they um, mark student down for that you need to start working on so you have a good basis. Read critical articles, read up about your text to get strong ideas and interpretations that will help you to stand out from the rest of the English cohort. Develop strong interpretations, practice planning and writing powerful contention statements and powerful arguments. And add analysis into your quote banks. This directly acts as practice for essay writing when you accumulate quotes that uh, and take note into your quote banks. Write a minion analysis uh, sentence for each one to practice uh, forming ideas, your critical thinking. <clears throat> so you can do this on the spot for essays or even remember when you use that quote what your analytical idea was. Um, to show complexity, I've already talked about these tips. I, I know that we've talked about them and they're just um, attached here. But you can follow this sort of structure as well for your body paragraph topic sentences. Your first one, uh, maybe it's just a different way to view it that will help you understand it better. But you start with tunnel vision. You start simple. Your first topic sentence is almost just answering the prompt itself. Your second one might be considering a different perspective. It might be your counter argument. However, here's how there is a different perspective you could have here. So in this example, your counter argument actually goes second. And your third most complex argument that's building on both of these two is a nuanced views and values message that the author has. So your actual topic sentence is uh, a statement about what the author is setting out to do, a views and value statement. Why is this beneficial? Because your essays, as I said, your arguments need to build on each other in order to do really well. That shows logical development and um, gradual um, complexity building in your essay. So, of course, your contention is relevant for your whole essay. And we said all the arguments need to stem from it. Your first idea is that tunnel vision. It builds from your contention. It's, it's that main idea you have in relation to the prompt. Idea two builds on idea one. And it can, this topic sentence can only be made based off what you said in the first topic sentence. And that may be you arguing with yourself and presenting that counter argument. And idea three is the point you can only make because of what you established in one and two and is your most complex idea, such as a views and values statement about the offer that uh, you're trying to justify throughout that body paragraph. Beautiful. Now moving into crafting text. Um, so for this area of study, um, your teachers or your school as a whole will be choosing something called a framework or a broad idea as the focus for, for the assessment task for your school-based SAC. Um, essentially, you can view the framework as like a big, broad theme of some kind. It could be anything. 
future, bravery, human connection, belonging, storytelling, surrealism. It's just one big idea, okay? And then you will be studying text. The first uh, text that you will be studying, um, you will be looking for that broad idea in that text. So let's say um, it's about future. You're looking at how the text presents future, what, what are the underlying views and values, and how it's been constructed, how the text has been constructed to be about future. You study a bunch of things called mentor text, which can be literally anything. It could be a podcast, it could be a song, it could be a short story, and they're all different text types. And in all of these, you complete a close analysis looking for the same thing, how that framework has been depicted and how it's been constructed in that text. Okay, so does, oh, does the author of the first mentor text present future maybe as something terrifying, something filled with uncertainty. And then the next offer maybe that you're studying presents future as something to look forward to, something exciting. Then you're kind of deciding which idea do I like better? And also what style of writing is more appealing to me? You look for language devices, you look at overall how did the offer structure and create this text and then you write your own creative piece. Your own creative piece that is completely your own creation. It doesn't plagiarize any of the text. It's not a part of one of the texts. You know, it doesn't relate to them except for the fact that it takes inspiration from them. So it may take language devices and you can make them into your own and change them as you please. It may take views and values ideas and you might be incorporating them in your own way through your own creative writing and at the end you do have to take inspiration from the mentor text and it cannot just be a random creative piece that you've decided to write about a framework because you will be writing a statement of intention where you analyze your own choices as the author and what inspired them Okay, so how you strayed from a mentor text or how you took things from it because it inspired you and you incorporated them into your own writing. So in year 12, you'll have a specific set of four frameworks and specific mentor texts assigned to you and those will match what will be on the exam. In year 11, you have heaps of flexibility with this task and schools may try to present it to you in an engaging, fun way, but ultimately, there are a few things here. You need to work on your creative writing, figure out what text types you feel most comfortable writing in, be able to closely analyze a text as much as possible, look at structural elements, pick up language devices, because you will need to incorporate your own language devices and structural features into your piece as well. And you need to know the features of various and various different text types and be able to um, write in these text types. So there is a lot here. Now I've created a bit of a summary note that I'm not going to sit here and read them all out to you. Um, but through this uh, area of study, you will write in, I, I expect in all, if not most of these, or at least study mentor text in all at least most of these text types. Um, so before you even look at a mentor text, knowing it's of a certain text type, I would go and make sure you're confident in its features first and you understand it really well and how it works um, because that way you will benefit more. So have notes, accumulate um, sort of meta language banks about techniques and use it to your advantage. Again, the triangle comes back. Um, your creative choices, all of this you must plan and put it into your text. The creative piece that you create, uh, your crafted text must have all of these elements 
okay just like when we're looking at text response so this all needs to be well thought out and don't forget your framework your big idea has to be implied throughout the whole piece um and that may be you know that might we might say is themes you become an author basically so let's work with an example let's imagine you received the framework of belonging um as part of your crafting text uh studies in school um you understand the theme you understand what you what to expect from it to belong versus to not belong people being excluded or accepted you have a good idea about it and uh, you've read a book that maybe was about belonging as well and you've analyzed um, and looked at how that idea was relayed there now you come to school and you're told that you're looking at a mentor text today that is uh that you may use to inspire your own crafting text sack um, and is going to be a short story so in preparation you think you might even use short stories for for the sack so that's great but you also want to be prepared to closely analyze it so you first review the features of a short story so that you're prepared and you know what to look out for so what do you need to know about this text type it's got the least structure it's uh the easy one of the easiest and most common choices made by students really easy to write in heaps of flexibility you will need a few characters characters a balance between dialogue and descriptions and some thought to how the plot is going to develop to keep it engaging but um advantages of it you've got lots of flexibility you don't have a set structure that you have to apply there's lots of text available that you could be using as inspiration it's really easy to put a framework um, into a short story to make it the center of the whole short story um, also pretty easy to incorporate language devices like imagery metaphors similes um, and to fulfill the word count for a school-based assessment if there is one <laughs> Now, I would say these these are these these are commonly how short stories are, but this doesn't apply to all of them um, at all. Um, but they usually have a single plot from one person's perspective rather than multiple, and this is how they usually flow. The one that we are about to analyze now has all of these elements as well. Most short stories start with an exposition, which is description given given to the reader. In the beginning to give them information it might be about the character's life or it might be setting and similar then throughout the story there's sort of rising action tension increases slowly so you're trying to increase tension and thus the reader's interest by creating engaging dialogue by creating engaging descriptions but dialogue will be the main plot driver in most of these um and then there is a, some sort of climax the peak moment of tension when the tension is highest the thing that happens in the short story that is uh the peak of that tension usually to do with whatever conflict there is um and eventually the tension subsides and is decreased and we have a resolution of some sort short stories center around a, a theme usually so if you have to base it around an overarching idea this is exactly what your framework's role is going to be oftentimes in a short story that would be presented as the challenge or the struggle that the main character is trying to overcome now there's usually some kind of conflict the framework can focus around that as well can be to do with anything in the personal life or a physical um, challenge uh, to the main character. Um, it's description focused and the descriptions and dialogue drive plot development and need to be well balanced. Characterization is crucial. 
<clears throat> leave lots of things implied, okay? Um, don't make things too obvious, but make sure they're the reader gets a certain flavor of who the main character is and how they are their personality it should be um a lot of that should be Im implicit first person point of view is personally recommended by myself if writing your piece in a short story format because if you want to incorporate a framework and really relate through your piece it will be easier to do if you can describe what the character is thinking, feeling, than if you go for a third person perspective and it's less personal. Okay, so now let's imagine we're reviewing our mentor text, a short story, and we're looking for how the framework of belonging has been represented. All right, so the story starts with a bit of a hook rather than going straight to the exposition to try to spark reader's engagement. Yes, she said, it's incredible. And then we have an exposition. It was quite stupid of people, she thought, to make everything, even conversation, so interrelated and dependent that she could not say merely that it was incredible, but must be referring to something preceding or obvious nothing exists she thought unless it depends upon something previous people are incapable of realizing anything that does not bear upon that interrelation in this case it was the number of warm days that was incredible warm days being a factor in anyone's understanding instead of anything more important and there seemed to be so few important things she thought desperately besides the weather so this exposition is all about the internal world of this character our unnamed protagonist, and as we'll see later, I like it though, said her mother, the person she's talking to is her mother. Okay, so through the lens of the framework of belonging, we, we can already identify that this character feels like she doesn't belong. She deliberately excludes herself because she thinks that people around her, including her own mother, uh, are interested in things that are plain and boring and that people are shallow, okay? She's talking about a weather, about the weather instead of anything more important, and there seem to be so few important things. Um, humans are too simple, and um, they can't think for themselves because um, nothing exists unless it de depends upon something previous. If it doesn't affect me, I don't care mentality. That's what she's talking about. That's how she views the world and other people. So we see someone who deliberately doesn't feel belonging with other people. And that's our protagonist. There, her mother liked it in the pattern which existed around and in and was part of her mother. There was a place for liking the weather. Look, said, said her mother, she's there again. So we see a dialogue is driving the plot progression. We've been introduced to another character. Not only the mother was introduced by dialogue, but we're seeing someone else now. She's there again. I thought she had moved. And a good thing too, said her mother. No better than she should be. Decent people expected to live with a woman who, with a woman like that. More than a person should be expected to put up with. I suggested to the landlord that he put her out. Again, it was the concreteness of the act of forcing a woman out of a house that was important. It was the fact of mentioning it to the landlord that was important. So we see belonging is explored more. Now we see a character that is being deliberately excluded. It's not revealed to us as to why. It's kind of implied that there's something wrong with this woman. She stands out somehow. But the mother says that she can't stand living in the same building with her. And uh, she's even talking to the landlord about it. And there's that difference in the views and values between the mother and the daughter. The daughter believes this is unfair and cruel and it's not right. Um, and she's aware that this neighbor is being deliberately excluded for some kind of personal factors, thereby lacking belonging. Um, you could look, uh, I guess you could apply a framework of prejudice to this text as well um, and look at it through that lens. We see the climax occurring through the dialogue. 
uh, the mother getting angry. It is a quite a low tension um, climax because this is a very short, short story. Queer said her mother, queer to refuse to live in the same house with that woman. And now she comes and stands on the corner, on the corner. The corner was important, more important than the woman. The woman derived her actuality from the place where she lived, her landlord, the people she lived with, the corner she stood on. There was no woman, there was a corner, and a corner was no place for a woman to stand any more than a decent house was any place for her to live. So it's quite sarcastic um, in commenting that uh, on that belonging that, you know, she's been de deliberately excluded to the point that the corner of the street is even viewed as being too good for her um, and she's undeserving of even that corner. We see the, the nearing of the resolution where the conflict subsides. The mother kind of backs off. Don't blame the poor creature you don't really know. And anyway, she's to be forgiven. The woman then existed to be forgiven. Not blamed, not understood, forgiven. So no one's trying to understand her. And we see the final resolution down at the bottom. So this is how you may take a mentor text and break it up. Okay, and then if you, is let's say it's your turn to craft your own text, you studied a variety of mentor texts and you lack this text, maybe you lacked the uh, idea of this protagonist that chooses to be different. She chooses not to belong with these judgmental people. Maybe you want to take that and make that how you incorporate the framework. Maybe you like this style of contemplation of this internal monologue maybe you like the sarcasm and the implicit way some of these sentences have been phrased to relay that internal monologue her true feelings of the protagonist and those could just be the things that you take to base your own um crafting text sack around so this is exactly what you'll be doing throughout the year the degree of inspiration you want to take is completely up to you, but you cannot plagiarize anything as well. So again, plan for these, the, the four elements from the pyramid, plan for themes. This must be around your allocated framework. You can incorporate other themes, but the framework should stick out as the center theme of your piece. Look for views and values. You can create a moral of the story, basically what lesson you want the audience to take away from your text, but you don't have to. You know, you can make it really implicit and just center your uh, creative writing around sort of implicitly relaying your attitudes and opinions about that framework that you've been assigned okay but you do need to put in some thought because um you will need to analyze in your statement of intention what your broad message or meaning was of your piece and um how that relates to your mentor text did you stray from them because you disagreed with them or did you take something from them that you liked and altered it must relate to your framework your themes your your views and values message should relate to your framework <clears throat> structural devices the bulk of your marks will lie here you need to show that you can write and incorporate different uh, language devices and structural features um similarly part of this is um whatever uh, text type you have chosen to write making sure you do it well, making sure you follow the conventions and the rules of that text type that you've chosen. Some structural devices definitely need to be avoided. And the big one is cliches, those common generalized sayings, they make writing seem cheap and unprofessional. So all those typical phrases, um, you need to cross them out. We have an example here. Be creative, take inspiration from what mentor text have done and try to do it in your own way. 
It will take some planning. Um, don't copy anything, avoid plagiarism. I've included a few other structural devices, um, but this is not an extensive list whatsoever. It would be pages and pages. Um, some more general tips for writing and being the author yourself. Um, unless the text type that you're writing in forces you to, such as a diary entry, um, you should be writing scenes as if they happen in real time. Make sure everything is in present tense. Um, that will really make it feel realistic and sound like uh, actually engaging. Um, use description and dialogue that attacks the five senses. Don't just show, don't, don't just tell um, the reader what they see show them what they see. So use language that attacks the five senses, write about, okay, if the reader was in this setting, what would they hear? What would they smell? Try to get the atmosphere on paper more rather than having an extensive, overly descriptive uh, description. Looking at this example, sorry I'm late, he yells over the intense ambient noise of conversation and snippets of discordant soprano sax. So in this example, it's attacking your, you know, it's all about auditory uh, senses and what you hear. Intense ambient noise of conversation. You feel like in this setting, it's busy, it's bustling. There's lots of people. It's a really popular place. Snippets of discordant soprano sax. Now you're thinking maybe it's some kind of, uh, jazz bar, some, there's some kind of music, it's a relaxed setting, everyone is chatting while there is music playing. Um, so that's part of that show don't tell, use language that attacks the five senses and as part of that as well avoid ever telling the obvious. As an example avoid telling readers how your character is feeling, instead try to depict it. So instead of saying that your character is nervous, you could detail that the character's eyes are flickering, maybe the character is biting their nails, shaking their foot, quivering um, their lips. Don't make it obvious, write about what you physically see and hint at their emotions. Remember the conventions of dialogue. There are rules. Every single time there's a new speaker, you must start a new paragraph with new indents. Um, before you close an indent, it must be properly punctuated, whether that's a question mark, an exclamation mark, uh, punctuate, uh, you know, just a dot to add emphasis. Otherwise, you just you put a comma. If you put a dot, if you leave a dot within the indents, that's done for emphasis. Um, otherwise, it's comma. Uh, you should limit conversations. A big one that students struggle with is making dialogue feel alive. The problem is writing too much dialogue, especially for one character, and making it as though uh, characters are speaking at each other like a wall rather than to each other. Both uh, interlocutors should be active in the conversation as a general rule, rule, set a limit of less than three lines per speaker. Most dialogue should be shorter than that anyway. Um, as a writing technique, get used to varying your lengths to this is how you build tension through your description. We said dialogue is the best way of building tension and driving plot development, but you can also do it through um, your sentence lengths um, and for your descriptions. So writing longer sentences, this whole thing is one sentence, creates a relaxed pace that reduces tension, slow and relaxed and you know can relay uh, some feelings like romantic, nostalgic feelings, whatever you're going for. And short sentence lengths are aimed to create tension, something really important is happening, it's fast paced, there's drama, uh, and uh, it helps, it's beneficial to do this just before that tension breaks and you, you know, 
reach that most tense moment of your of your piece so vary your sentence lengths don't exaggerate it like this and write a whole paragraph of short sentences but you get the idea choosing your point of view deciding whether you want to write in first person or third person as i said with first person you it is generally more engaging i feel like to do a uh, third person is great as long as you're a pretty good writer because it can be harder to do third person well than to do first person well so you can um engage the reader more with first person give insight into why characters are the way they are and you have more freedom to tell um remember we just looked at show don't tell and i was saying how you can avoid telling readers everything making everything obvious and boring but first person allows you to tell things more whereas if you write a third person in third person you're literally an observer so you can't tell anything you have to show everything how you know you see it from a third person perspective and you can never obviously state something you can't state the obvious in a third person perspective now with third person you can flow in and out of points of view but that's not the priority and not something you'd likely do with frameworks anyway um but it can allow you to explore more big picture ideas again um they're both great but it takes some skill to do third person well and to do third person well with incorporating a framework additional things you can do to make your piece more interesting work with time carefully manipulate time mix up the pace use those uh variations in sentence lengths uh that we talked about suddenly offset uh tension through dialogue and then suddenly calm it down through description um so have fun with it you can do things like freezing time going to the future or foreshadowing that something is going to happen change paces work with slow pace and fast pace if you're concerned about how to start and finish in an engaging way or how to start in general bookends is a great technique this is where you begin your piece so the first line or sentence of your piece is starting a certain idea or putting down the first half of a certain language device and it doesn't finish it and then it just proceeds with the story maybe it goes to you know some description and you only come back to the bookend at the very end so the very last lines of your text or the sentences go and finish that idea or language device that you started at the very start of your piece so you all of a sudden come back to it tie it together resolve it and that's how your piece finishes so it must be well thought out looking at an example she looked deep into his eyes and wondered how they'd ever ended up together in the first place and that might be at the start of our piece and then at the end she looked deep into his eyes and wondered how she'd ever been without him so we see a bit of antithesis here opposite ideas being presented showing the character development that she has undergone to realize that uh, she really needs this person yeah overall scoring well thorough planning is needed and very close analysis of your mentor text um in year 11 especially i don't think you'll get in trouble to go out of your way to find your own mentor text that you like if you don't like the ones from school do maybe ask your teachers if you can use an external source if they let you um hopefully they do in year 11 i don't see why not um work with incorporating frameworks when you do get a framework as well just break it down and examine um the different ways you can expect it to be presented how you uh, would visualize it how you would think to write about it um, and develop your ideas further as you study more mentor texts um, you need to have knowledge of structural features try to get that now while you're working with text response because remember on top of 
already needing to know language devices and structural features confidently, you will also need to know different text types uh, and be able to write in different text types. Some extra um, techniques here. Hopefully you're confident in at least um, some of these. All right, now our short bit on analyzing argument, and it is very short, uh, remembering back to, it's all about reading something like an article, opinion piece, a speech, and understanding what the author is trying to convince their audience of. What is their main argument? What points of view do they express? How are they convincing? And that's uh, most of your analysis is around those persuasive language techniques. How do they aim to convince? Now, um, today we look at contentions. We looked at contentions for text response. It's that main argument. So because we're, you should come back, you know, in April for more detail on analyzing argument when it's a bit closer. For now, we're looking at contentions because we already understand what contentions are. It's the main interpretation. So this is your main interpretation in an analyzing argument piece of what the author's intentions are. So a good contention should be structured based on this flowchart and have all of these elements. It should briefly mention what the issue examined by the author is, whether the author thinks that issue is good or bad with a better term usually an adjective term to describe it. It should also uh, give the main reason as to why they think it's good or bad um, and what the author wants done. What is their point, their purpose of writing this piece? So as an example, the author contends, and you should have this vocabulary, it should be the author or the last name, contends that the hostile attitude of male cyclists this is our issue, is unacceptable, that's our adjective to describe good or bad, clearly they view it as bad, because it endangers other road users, that's the implications, why it's good or bad. Calling for a more civil, communal manner, so essentially the author wants some kind of alternative to be put in place as their goal. Notice how it needs to be nice and succinct as well, so you need to practice this with different pieces and uh, it is the aim of a contention to be clear as much as possible and not to ramble. Um, so this is kind of just laying it out in more of a easy for notes format. Um, note as well that a contention should also identify the tone word. You will be expected to write about the overall tone of the piece in your intro. And you just need to name it. In the body paragraphs, one of the PLTs you can analyze with the what, how, why process is tonal shifts, and it's very valuable. So you'll need a good understanding of tone and a large collection of tone words for this area of study. Feel free to follow this template, it's quite foolproof. The offer in a tone word with the word ending Lee to make it into the right form contends that the issue. So let's say critically contends that the name of the issue is word for good or bad because what is their main reason why it's good or bad and therefore wants this to be done. <clears throat> so your introductions um, doesn't have to be in a specific order, but generally you start with the context. First, you introduce the piece uh, that you're working with. You name the text type. Is it an opinion piece? Is it an article? Is it a speech? Is it a podcast? It, who is the author? What are the publication details? So where was it published or if it's spoken, where was it pre presented or delivered? Um, what is the date and time of publication, place of publication? And what is the title? So you state the contextual details first, then you state the contention following all the elements we've just looked at and identifying the tone as part of your contention statement. And you must also, somewhere in there, mention the audience group and the purpose, generally in a sentence uh, after the contention and tone have been done. Your body paragraphs are basically the sub-arguments. If the contention is the overall idea of what the author is trying to do, 
their primary argument. The body paragraphs, the topic sentences, are the sub-arguments, the little parts of their argument that you will find, oh, these five paragraphs talk about one argument, these four paragraphs have another argument to them. And you need to track um, when one argument becomes another argument, and now it's like a separate uh, argument that you need to write about and cover. And you can tell generally just from the changes in the subject matter that we've moved on to a different argument. Okay. And your final sentence, your concluding sentence, now should link into the ultimate authorial intent or effect of the reader. The ultimate thing for this sub-argument that the author is trying to convince of or achieve or the ultimate effect that they're trying to have on the reader. And influence them in that way. There will be visuals in, in the pieces that you study. Um, and these all need to be analyzed. You cannot disregard visuals. When linking to a visual, you must not start a separate body paragraph. It is part of a bigger paragraph and part of an argument. So you need to decide what argument does the image support, essentially. Um, essentially, you're writing, you have your topic sentence, your argument for that paragraph, you're doing the evidence and analyze, doing the what, how, why process for your PLTs, and you stop analyzing uh, one of these pieces of evidence, and you want to connect to the image. So it will be something along the lines of this analysis that I've just given, right, this is further supported by this cartoon that shows blah, blah, blah. And then after introducing the image and linking it in, you analyze it too. You choose one or two things that are interesting to analyze and you complete the what, how, why for the image now rather than just the, the text, you know. That should be in relation to the argument. Ultimately, uh, you're analyzing how the image further supports the author's argument. And then you connect back to your concluding sentence once you're done. Or if you're not ready, you go back to the text and you analyze more textual evidence. So the steps in visual analysis are as follows. As we said, first you need to find that gateway. Connect that the image further supports an idea that you've just analyzed in one of your PLTs. So you need to plan for this. Um, firstly, you need to describe what the visual is literally de depicting, AKA what is the type of visual, cartoon, caricature, diagram, drawing, painting, photograph, and then state what you see in it overall, what is relevant, what is depict based on what you see in the foreground, the background, and any and all central elements that may be relevant. And then for one to two things that you found interesting, you complete that what, how, why process. Okay. Um, and it's good to have a wrap up of how it contributes to the author's argument, but you don't have to. You can just do that as part of step two, as part of completing the what, how, why. Things that you can look for in a visual, and you can even look at having a go at analyzing this because you don't really need any background knowledge for this. Um, you do need to use appropriate meta language for visual analysis as well. Just note that the meta language is quite simple. Um, so it is expected that you should be quite confident in using it. Um, something I'd importantly add is colors as well is a good thing to analyze. That's not there. Um, <clears throat> I'm happy not to look at that example because we did look at the what, how, why, but feel free to have a look at that on the slides. So now in our little final section, these are just some final tips for you guys. It was your summer holidays just now. It's about to be uh, back to school time. So make sure you've read or watched all of your texts to stand out from your cohort to be confident and able to engage in class discussions, look for supplementary materials to help you get ahead in the subject. Start with text response because it builds the essential skills you'll need to do well in crafting text. Um, and 
language analysis when you do analyzing argument that is generally more formulaic and liked by students. Um, you can come back in April for that, uh, but I recommend focusing on your unit free areas of study first. Annotate your text. Think um, about the purpose of everything. Question everything. C create those quote and an analytical idea banks. Okay. You need to question the importance of everything to hone your critical thinking and analytical skills so that by the time you get to your 12 and even more so by the time you get to exams, you're a student that easily comes up with strong analytical ideas that differentiate them from the rest of the cohort. Um, when you annotate, this is a little list of things that you can look for. Uh, one, I don't want you to disregard is vocab you don't understand. Please define it for yourself and make sure you understand it because you could be missing something important. Um, if you find something that's important and you, you think and you don't know what it means, it's even good to put question marks in your book and try to clarify how that thing is significant and what it means, either by looking it up or talking to others and your English teacher. Importantly, look for literary devices and structural features. Look for views and values. Look for quotes that are significant. <clears throat> and analyze uh, when when you're when you're doing this. Analyze the quotes as well. Write those mini analytical dot points, and create um, notes that are organized based on that pyramid. So you have views and values, ideas and interpretations that you've made, themes, um, characters language devices and structural features in your notes organized don't write essays purposely but write essays to improve so everything you write should have a reason and a purpose um, and that's the only way to improve always plan before you write i think i've stressed that a lot um, if you want to experiment do lots of practice writing experiment with new ideas and structures or vocabulary, do some practice writing for that, and work with both easy and difficult prompts to make sure that you can do both. Um, the biggest point is that you should always be trying to improve on something, and you should be targeting weaknesses. For example, you find that you can't write good topic sentences, so you do prompt breakdowns and plans, and you write give yourself time to write the strongest contention you think you can write and the strongest topic sentences making sure they're relevant and you do that over and over and that takes you 10 minutes rather than spending an hour and a half writing an essay okay um, if you don't know how to integrate quotes you work on that um, and write plain sentences where you're trying to integrate quotes before you try to write a whole body paragraph and stick it all together um, if you can't write an essay in an hour, you only write with time conditions and you force yourself to write and give yourself five minutes for an intro, 15 minutes for a body paragraph and five minutes for a conclusion, for example. So do specific things to help yourself improve, identify what you're struggling with. Remember that there's different things that you can do outside of just essay writing. It's even beneficial to read about your text um, and it can be really interesting reading uh, critics analysis on your text. You can rewrite old essays to try to improve them based on areas that you identified. Um, you can work on skim reading your text and annotating it, looking for quotes. Anyways, there's lots of ideas of other things other than essay writing you can do in English. Anyways, thank you guys so much for coming along and I hope you found this lecture to be really useful and I wish you best of luck uh, for the rest of the year with English. Thank you everyone.